Happy New Year and welcome to a brand new episode of the Michelle Tafoya podcast. If you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you're an aunt, uncle, you have kids in your life, listen up. There is a county in Maryland where they actually give schools the ability to lie to parents, to keep information from parents about their kids' requests about gender ideology, about their gender identity. Now, if your kid were getting in trouble at school, you'd want to know, right? If your kid were smoking pot behind the bleachers, you'd want to know, right? If your kid were romantically involved with a teacher, you'd want to know, right? All of these things, if your kid was failing a class, you'd want to know, right? So if you'd want to know all of those things, I'm sure the well-being of your child includes how they feel, how they see themselves in the world, meaning maybe their gender identity. But that, for some reason, has been exempted by this school district in Maryland. If a kid decides he wants to switch or she wants to switch identities, go by a different name, different pronouns, use a different bathroom, that kid can say to the school, don't tell my parents, and the school must oblige. So information being kept from parents. Now, this is being presented to the Supreme Court to be ruled upon because, frankly, parents are forced to put their kids in school by law. Shouldn't they then know about their kids' well-being in total at school? We're going to talk to a gentleman by the name of David DeLugas. He is an attorney, went to Duke, uh, and is now part of an organization called ParentsUSA.org. ParentsUSA.org. I encourage you to go to the page and see what they're up to. If you're a college basketball fan, you may recognize his partner, Rashawn McLeod, who played at Duke uh, under Mike Krzyzewski, is part of the organization as well. We're going to talk to David, a very well-respected lawyer, about this case and about what it means. And by the way, this is, this is not isolated to Maryland. This is going on at thousands of schools across the country. Is your kid's school one of them? And how would you feel if information, any information about your child was being withheld from you, the parent whose job it is to put that kid in that school? We're going to talk to David DeLugas about this fascinating conversation. That is next. Welcome to the Michelle Tafoya podcast. David, welcome to the podcast. We're really grateful to have you. I think that parents are kind of being, if some people had their way, parents might be taken out of the equation altogether in the education, the upbringing, the, I don't make, mean to make it sound so stark, but when parents are kept from information or information is kept from parents about their children in schools, that is terrifying to me. So what about that can you and your organization change right now? I'd like to tell you that we can change a lot, but frankly, the entire system is not geared toward rapid change. The legal system itself is extraordinarily slow. It's uncertain. Um, voting, elections, people running for school boards uh, perhaps can be a, a bit quicker. But our organization is intent on education of parents, as well as intervening as, a, as we can and our resources allow us in legal proceedings, such as a recently filed amicus brief in the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, let's the- talk about that. I'd love to get to find out what that is all about and what people should know about this. Go ahead. Well, the the case is parents uh, using uh, pseudonyms because they're concerned about the retaliation against their children, their their students at a school by the parents challenging a Montgomery County, Maryland uh, Board of Education policy. Now, it shouldn't matter what the policy subject is, but I'm going to reveal that because it is the hotbed of what's going on across the country. It's a gender identity policy. Now, let's be clear. What the policy says is the school wants to have students feel safe and comfortable at school. 
and therefore requires the school teachers, staff, and other students to comply with whatever is imposed based solely on a particular person at that particular school communicating with a student about the level of support that the student has or does not have at home for the gender identity issues that that student is, hand, is dealing with, okay. whatever those may be. Now, Let, can I just stop you really quick? Because I, I <clears throat> want to make sure everyone gets that right. There was a lot there. So what would be an example of, of how this policy might be implemented, let's say, for, for a kid? Well, I am given, going to try to illustrate by giving you an example based on what I understand and believe in having read that policy. So this hasn't been written by the school, but this is what I believe the policy would require. <clears throat> a student shows up at school and goes to a teacher and says, instead of calling me by my enrolled name and my given name on my birth certificate, I prefer you call me by, and it's a different gender name, a, a name more frequently associated with a different gender. The school then has to assign a person to meet with the student, discuss what is going on at home and in their life and what their preferences are about their attire, about how they um, conduct themselves, which restroom they use, which locker room they use and the like. And based solely on what the student reveals or says, literally says, then the school implements this policy, circulates the information to the others in the school, and teachers are then required, whether they agree with this policy or not, their job depends on them following the policy, they must then follow that policy and address the student, including hiding the information from the parents so that the report card online information still will use the name given when they enrolled, enrolled by their parents, by the way. Right. Uh, and yet the parents are oblivious. They're in the dark. They have no idea what's going on at school. What age range are we talking about here? What grade level? That's, that's a great question. And I, I know a lot of interviewees and people on podcasts. Hey, that's a great question. No, that is a great question. Interesting and troubling is it has no limitation. It's for every student at every level within the Montgomery County, Maryland public schools. So, so if it, I'm an eight-year-old and I'm confused or I want to I want to play a trick on my teachers. There you go. I can, I can go do that. You can. You can play a trick on your teachers. You can curry favor with your teachers. You can, because of other students and peer uh, pressures, you want to somehow present yourself to your peers just while you're at school for whatever reason. Because, come on, kids are kids. They do things for reasons we don't even begin to understand. Their brains aren't formed. <laughs> and they're persuaded easily. And, again, yes. this isn't necessarily about gender. That's one of the points I make for Parents USA in our amicus brief is, regardless of what's motivating the child at school to take the stand they are, Something needs to be shared with the parents. It's, it's particularly bothersome that the schools are modeling, modeling deceit. Yes. They're teaching, yeah. they're teaching deceit, which let's face it, in society <clears throat> is not a trait uh, or a habit that works well. You, you it's can't not, lie. although although I will interject that people are certainly getting away with a lot of deceit these days and well, not paying the consequence, but it is yeah. still not uh, behavior that should be modeled, particularly by teachers and administrators to school children. Uh, this is crazy. So this is Montgomery County, uh, Maryland, you said, right? right. Okay. And, and yes. Go ahead. And, and the uh, the parents are pointing out in their their brief, and keep in mind, the parents started in a U.S. district court challenging this policy. They they term it the parental preclusion policy. That's what they're giving it that name because again, it hides the information from the parents. So the parents don't know if this is applicable to their child or not. <clears throat> they just know that the school has this policy. Um, it went to the U.S. District Court. It went to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the level above district court. We'll call it the appellate court. 
And then the U.S. Supreme Court is not required, as we're probably learning a lot in news recently, Mm -hmm. they're not required to take every appeal, if you will. It's called a writ of certiorari, fancy name for, hey, Supreme Court, this is what one of the lower circuit courts of appeals in the United States did. We don't think it's right or a correct legal ruling. Would you take a look at it? And the Supreme Court says, okay, we will. Or no, we're not going to. We're going to let that lower court ruling stand. So the parents filed that petition and the school will be filing a response. But meanwhile, amicus, the the term literally means friends of the court, Mm -hmm. have filed amicus briefs to the Supreme Court's presenting arguments and positions. I've read those other amicus briefs, and they're all very well done. Most all of them discuss legal presentations and issues and authorities. I think the petitioners did a darn good job. One of the positions taken, I thought it was a really good one, was the free speech rights of the other teachers and administrators at a school who don't want to be forced to say things or do things that is against their particular point of view particularly if it's based on their religion. That you said, know, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 right, please sorry. go ahead. Parents USA thought it appropriate and maybe better to help the court understand the real world consequences or the real world uh, uh, application. And as I wrote in, in our amicus brief, one of the opening lines is, my dog ate my homework in quotation marks, as students have said throughout the course of history. And what does that illustrate? And I go on with with, um, links to articles all over the internet about children and lying, deceit. Here's the point. Does the school know that the child telling them, gee, if my parents learn about my preference or my confusion with my gender, my parents aren't going to be supportive? Well, there's a difference in not supporting versus they're going to beat the child ostracize the child, hurt the child. Maybe the child is is mistaken. Maybe the, the parents would be relieved to know the child has come forth with the truth, will be supportive. Either way, the school is basing their position solely on what the child tells them, which again may be to curry favor with a particular teacher who they think will give them a break on their homework or their assignments. They're now a favored teacher. They're brown nosing a teacher by claiming a gender confusion issue they don't really have, or they have it, but the lack of support at home doesn't really exist. But now they're being coddled by the school under this, again, false information the student is bringing because let's face it, the idea that children are always going to be honest with teachers (laughs) in school. I mean, as well as let me get this point in real quick. The other is, aren't schools supposed to be teaching how to deal with Conflict. They, they've, they've stopped that. They are trying to just protect kids from every adversity, thereby denying kids this yep. incredible opportunity to learn, grow, become stronger, earn the scar tissue that gets them through the rest of their lives. And so this is really bothersome. Now, there we could we could detail myriad reasons why a kid may come forward and tell a teacher this. Like you, I, I mean, there are a million reasons right. a kid might want to do this, right? But the Mm -hmm. point is, and you make a very good point about freedom of speech, because freedom of speech is not just about allowing people to speak their minds. You cannot compel people to say things they don't want to say or that they believe. I think that that compelling thing is coming in a lot lately. Oh, you know, silence is violence. You've got to speak out, yada, yada. No, you don't. But at the same time, um, to, to compel a teacher to do something against his or her beliefs, and very often it, it's not just religious, it's a moral thing for these teachers. They feel like, you know what, I know this kid's mom. I know this kid's dad. They they need to know this, you know, or, or whatever it is. The point is, and it seems pretty simple to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you're taking parents out of the equation and you're actually lying to them because what you, what's going on at school is not being conveyed to the parents who not only birthed or adopted these children, but are paying every bill for these kids are assuming the responsibility to keep them safe and keep them out of trouble and everything else that parents do. 
This is insane. How does a policy like this one at the Montgomery, this this particular school district, how does it come to be? Who gives a school district authority to come up with a policy that keeps information from parents? Well, the simplest answer I can give you is across the country at every level of government, and that includes public schools, people will come forward with an idea. That idea will blossom into a piece of legislation or a policy imposed on the people. And frankly, it's up to us to push back. Now, the theory is that the U.S. Constitution and state constitutions actually are supposed to control the uh, acts of government. But in reality, government does what it does, and it's up to us to say, we don't agree, we need to vote you out, or we need to challenge it in the court system. Where I'm finding, as a lawyer, and I've been doing this for decades, as a lawyer, I'm a little troubled at how slow our system works and how how the courts aren't as decisive in their support of the U.S. Constitution, because that's our point of view. Parents USA doesn't take a position based on what we individually, personally believe is right for parents or, gosh, it's the right thing. No, we look at U.S. Supreme Court decisions in the past, over the years, that have molded and and found this thing that we have all been calling the constitutional rights of parents to decide for their children. And you said, as when you birth or adopt a child, you assume that responsibility. Here's another twist for you, and we put it in our brief. No, no. The government imposes this on us, too. By statute, parents have the responsibility to provide for their children. By statute in in Maryland, by the Code of Regulations in Maryland, parents are obligated under compulsory education laws. That's a topic for another another podcast with you one day, I hope. Um, They're obligated to ensure their children are attending school. Mm -hmm. Now, the parents can decide what school or what education service provider they select, public school, private school, homeschool, micro school, the choices are, are widening as we have learned over the year, recent years. The parents decide, but they have to, by law, do something. And only a parent can register a child at the Montgomery County Public Schools by by their forms online. Only a parent can. The, kid, the child can't register himself. The parent or guardian must show proof of the relationship between them and the the child or the student. So all of that being done, it's a requirement. And having that requirement imposed on parents and then the school on the flip side saying, you know what, but if there's something we don't want you to know because the child, your child, our student has told us either truthfully or lying to us, Mm -hmm. we're just not going to tell you. And as Uh, Since I I sent you our amicus brief, you know this. I said, but but what if the policy wasn't about gender? Let's take it out of that hot button. Let's talk about academic. Your child is flunking out of school. They're going to be held back. And the school, because the child tells them, gee, if my parents find out I haven't done my homework or I'm flunking, they're going to be really mad. So the school says, well, in that case, we don't want you to feel unsafe at home. (laughs) we're We're going to lie to your parents. What if it was about drug use? Or what if it was about sexual activity at school, as in a teacher and a student are having sex, consensual or not, and the school says, well, you know, your parents, you're telling us your parents would be upset about that. Well, yeah. (laughs) So our policy is we're going to hide that from them. So the idea that it's just about gender or it's closed-minded right-wingers or it's, no, it's parents. Parents being denied information about their child. If you take your child to a sports league, we both have, you have far more extensive sports background, but if you're the coach of your team is hiding things from you. Oh about my gosh. Your, if a karate instructor, a dance uh, academy teacher or coach or piano teacher learns something about your child and between, we're, we're just going to keep this a secret. And by the way, in everything having to do with child trafficking and sexual abuse of children, one of the earliest things that children are supposed to be taught is don't keep secrets from your parents. Don't keep secrets from your parents. That's what groomers and abusers do. Let's keep this a secret between you and me. And yet a school's going to teach them. It's okay. Yeah. This is, this is what 
this also brings up is the slippery slope that this can enable. If we start with just gender identity, and we're not going to tell your parents about you changing that, what happens next? You know, where does it go from there? What other policies can they implement that they can keep from the parents? It's almost as though, and you detailed this well, okay, the state compels you as parents to educate your children. But once in the once in this county's uh, school district, once in this Montgomery County school district, we don't have to tell you anything about that. I mean, that is that's I I don't want to get like exaggerate it, but that's cray cray. That's that's crazy to me. I, I, our opinion is legally you, you're not exaggerating. Legally, it's not wrong to have that reaction to a policy of a school, a place where you voluntarily enroll your child, right? relying upon the belief that your child is going to be receiving some education services. That's what I like to call public schools or any schooling system. They're service providers. They're not gods. They're not given an exalted status in our society there. Just like the doctor, the dentist, the karate teacher, right. the art instructor, they're service providers for your child that you you enroll them, drop them off, put them on the bus, get them to school, however you do it. And you they, pray to God that they are safe in that correct. school. I mean, to me, from the time I first dropped my oldest at school, I left every day going, I thank God he's safe. Thank right. God they're safe. But if, but now you'd have to question that in that school district and any other that comes up with this kind of policy. And believe me, this policy is, or this type of, you know, protecting kids from if they want to change their gender identities. And we could, I could give you personal examples of kids that I know mm -hmm. who at one point around the age of 11, 12, thought they were trans. And boop, a year later, that discussion was, they, they, they didn't even go there anymore. Like they were, it was this almost tr fad, trendy thing. I want attention. Look at me thing to do. So like we said, we could go in, into a zillion examples of why this could happen. But the bottom line is the people who should know. And you know what? In the minor, tiny percentage of cases uh, and I would venture a guess, and maybe you know the data, of instances where a kid does go home and comes out to his or her parents and they become unsafe, that's generally something that's reportable, right? Well, th that's another point we make is the as educators, the Maryland County public school system are what are called mandatory reporters, like doctors and others in certain positions, if they learn any information to suspect child abuse, they're required by law, by Maryland law, to report that to law enforcement or child protective services. That's what you do. Now, guess, here's the thing that's important to me as coming from the lawyer side of this. Child protective services and law enforcement. We can disagree about the level of competence at those agencies across the country, but here's what they do have. One, they have investigatory powers. They have due process uh, required, supposed to be required of them. They are trained in this arena. The schools are not. School teachers, staff, administrators are not trained. They don't go seek the truth. They just go, again, their policy is we don't look for the truth. We just go based 100% on what the student tells us. So your point's well taken. I believe the real, the uh, uh the important part of this is you can't trust the children to tell you the truth, even no matter what the topic is. And secondly is if, as you point out, that whatever percentage it is, if there is pro if there are problems at home, that's when it gets reported to child protection. Yeah. You, your parents ostracized you. They kicked you out of the house. They, they, they hurt you. They beat you, whatever they did. We're taking you out of that home. Child Protective Services is moving you somewhere else. Yep. That's the that's the absolute correct way to handle that problem in the minute instances where it does happen, of course. Otherwise, the best thing you can do is, and this is pointed out in the literature across the board, help the child and the parents resolve this problem. Exactly. Or issue. 
exactly. or discover it's not an issue. Get the parents the counseling, the support. Get the child the support. And yes, it may pass. I mean, Bill Maher, and I, I think one of his most pointed illustrations is when he was a child, he wanted to be a pirate. Good thing his <laughs> yeah. parents. I don't know if you've heard him say that, but I it's did. A, yeah, it's a good thing my parents didn't. I'd be walking around with a stub leg and a, you know and a hook. Uh -huh. um, and, and it's a it's a way. It, it's it's funny because there's some truth in it. It's funny because it illustrates on a serious topic gender confusion, gender identity, or a child who believes they're absolutely 100% committed, it's not confusion. They are committed to it. That's fine. It's acceptable. We as a society must and should accept. But parents should be part of the process oh. of that acceptance. Parents must be, children must be shown to confront conflict, problems, problem solving skills, resolution, if you go through life and you've been taught never to deal with something that you might imagine, because again, look, kids are kids. We've all been kids. So we remember, yeah. remember when you thought, oh my gosh, if my parents find out. <laughs> They're going to kill me. Yeah. I, I didn't make the team or yeah. I, 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 flunk, I didn't get an A in that class. I'm going to get in trouble. And then you didn't get in trouble. Yeah. Well, how often were kids wrong about the reaction from their parents? A lot. A lot. So again, Kids are kids. Brains aren't developed. They do things that are immature. That is why they are custodians of their parents or legal guardians. And uh, this is this is so scary to me that the, the the it seems to me there's a lot of this around the country, and, and particularly where gender identity is involved. And to me, uh, every parent cares first and foremost about their kids' health and happiness, and they want to be part of that. And um, this, again, we could talk about the myriad reasons kids might come up with this, and some of it might be legit and some of it might not be, but the family, the parents must be involved. How do you see this going? What's what's the schedule of this Supreme Court uh, consideration, and, and what do you think the odds are they'll hear it? Well, the, the parents filed their petition for writ, and not to get too technical, um, at late November and the case was docketed in December. The uh, amicus briefs were due January 4th, which we filed. And then the respondent, the school district, of course, using taxpayer money to pay their lawyers, will be filing the response, certainly defending the policy and contending that the Supreme Court should not even take the case up. But I'd like to think that the court will. Uh, there's some clarification that needs to happen because it's not just this particular policy but it's the entire issue of the rights of parents and when they have the right to complain, if you will. And, and incidentally, I, I've talked a lot on this, this matter, uh, not gender identity issues as much as the whole concept of the rights of parents. And here's a correction to the parents out there. Uh, apologies to parents. You're wrong if you believe that you have the right to dictate to any service provider how they have to treat your child curriculum, books, medical care, anything else. You don't. Your right is to make the decision as to who gets to do those things for your child. So if you don't like the school, you can take them out of school. If you don't like the doc, one of the examples I often use is if your child's ball coach keeps slapping them in the head <laughs> or in the helmet and uses profanity and you as a parent go, hey, coach, I'd really appreciate it if you wouldn't use those curse words in front of my child or at my child or hit them in the head and the coach tells you to F off, you can't make the coach coach different. You can withdraw your child from that program and send them to a different sports league or sit them out or find a different uh, sport to play, different coach, different league. So in other words, you don't like the school, fine, protest, go to the school board meeting, vote in the elections, file a lawsuit about this policy though is, is different. It's not just you're sending your child there and they're hiding information. Now, it'd be one thing if they had the policy, but they didn't hide information. I frankly think the legal argument pretty much goes away. The school can do the gender identity going along with the child, provided they reveal that information to the parent. The school policy we may not like, some people may not find abhorrent, morally wrong. But again, the choice then as a parent, because you're aware of it, you then withdraw your child, you either homeschool them, send them to a different public school, or as I tell parents, 
Yes, it might be uncomfortable, difficult, expensive. If you need to uproot yourself and move to a different state, to a different county, to a different school district, just remember back in the 1600s, people came on rickety boats with no GPS <laughs> from England to the U.S. seeking freedom. Mm -hmm. People used to go for, in Conestoga wagons without interstate highways from where they lived to another place in the USA, North America. It may be hard and may be difficult, but your right as a parent doesn't mean you can dictate to everybody what they have to do with your child, right. Right. only that you can decide which school, which coach, which sports league, which dance academy you send your child. That's your choice. Your, your right as a parent is to make decisions about their care and their upbringing. And that is why school choice is so hugely important as well. That's a, that's a, a bit of a tangential issue, although I think they're interrelated. But oh, totally. it, it, yeah, it's very, very important that every state provides that for families, to, for them to be able to decide and not be uh, destined to only go to a public school um, where you don't agree with this stuff or you don't like the way your kid is being right. educated, but, but you're compelled to put them in school. So school choice is hugely important. Yes. And it might be an inconvenience to move your kid from one school to another. I, I was faced with that decision once. And, uh, you know, here's, here's the other part. Um, th this is simply about parents' right to know. And as you put it beautifully, right. and we'll end with this, if this policy stayed the same, but involved the parents, there, there really wouldn't be this issue. Just don't, don't hide it from the parents. It's pretty simple, isn't it? I, I think it's extraordinarily simple. I hope our uh, friend of the court brief sways the justices on the U.S. Supreme Court to take this case. And uh, I'd certainly be tickled if in some way they referred to dog ate my homework <laughs> or something, give me an indication <laughs> that uh, we had some impact on it, which is why we do what we do. We, we are trying to be the voice of parents in, approaching it again, not from our personal points of view, but from the point of view, not outcome driven. The outcome isn't as important as the idea of the concept of parents' rights to know, the parents' rights to decide. And here in Maryland, they're caught in that, again, that, uh, triangle of the state requires you to send your child to school. The state requires you to enroll the child. Oh, but the state school is going to lie to you about the school that you're sending your child to. So you don't know you're not making an informed consumer decision. That, that's it's, the way I would put it. You're the consumer absurd. of educational services um, and you don't get to know. How can you make an informed decision about where to enroll your child. That's not that's like not putting the ingredients on something you're buying in the store and you don't know what you're ingesting or buying or uh, we could go through a thousand analogies. David Correct. DeLugas, again, it's parentsusa.org and I I love if you if you go to parentsusa.org <laughs> you'll see a photo of David. And how tall are you, David? Um I'd like to say 6 feet, but I'd be I'd be fudging a little bit, uh, but under the guidelines and policies, I'm allowed to lie. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, it's, I'm probably 5'11-ish. Yeah. Okay. And you're standing next to former Duke star basketball player and former NBA player Rashawn McLeod, whom I covered, by the way. And he yeah. makes you look like a dwarf. So that's a cute photo. Rashawn yeah. is involved. It's parentsusa.org. If you'd like to support them, clearly they're doing work that is... I think you've made a very good case that this is not ideological, but purely legal and constitutional and uh, trying to make sure that parents understand what is at their disposal to do, what they can't do. Um, and I, I'm going to be watching this closely, David, and hopefully we'll have you back with a resolution to this story, because this is something that is not going to be limited mm -hmm. to Maryland. It's going, it's, I'm sure it's happening all over the country. Thousands of school districts yep. across the country already are doing this. Yes. Yep. This is important. It's really important. Thank you for your work on this. Thanks for the time. We will see you again until then folks. Thanks for listening. And like David DeLugas and Rashawn McLeod, go check out their photo on the website. It's fun. Uh, be brave and do good, especially by your children or any children that you know. Um, you got to be brave for them. We will see you next time.